Good morning, fellow South Africans, Gautengas, activists of HNSA from all over. Uh, thank you to the leadership of HNSA here in Soweto, but in Gauteng in general. Uh, welcome to all of you who are here. I want to also give a special welcome to the medical professionals who are here with us this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ratong Bobeni. I serve as the national spokesperson of Action SA. I want to also um, acknowledge the leadership that is here uh, to my right or behind me. We are on location this morning here at Baragwanath Hospital. Some of us were born here. I don't know. Raise your hand if you were born here. We're all born here many moons ago. I see that uh, certain things have not. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a. I don't know. It's a sign of age, right? We were all born here and. Uh, at Baragwana. But yes, yeah, so we, we gather here this morning as members of Action SA, as those of us who are really working very hard to make sure that we can fix our country. You have seen our payoff line for this election is let's fix South Africa. One of those things is to fix what we are here to talk about today, the healthcare system. We know that in our country we have a very dire healthcare system. It's not by world standards the worst, but it definitely can be better. You have seen also around the country that this issue is not just here at Parapuanat. This issue is not just here in Soweto. You have seen uh, doctors protesting uh, in KZN, for example. Those of you who have been with us long enough will remember we ran a campaign uh, some years ago. I think it was before the 2021 elections. I don't remember anymore. But we ran a campaign as Action SA calling on all South African doctors to show up, those who are qualified to write into us and let us know that they are there because we were dealing with uh, an issue at the time when our government was uh, was importing doctors from Cuba. Do you all remember that? We ran that campaign and we received thousands upon thousands of doctors who are qualified in our country who are not being able to be absorbed in the system. And so we are here once again today to say we have not moved one needle and we are saying to the people of the day, to the government of the day, that we see you, we see what is happening, we see the injustice that is happening, particularly in our healthcare uh, system. You have seen a grandmother sitting on benches not getting help because the system is overloaded. You have seen doctors who are overworked because of the hours that they have to work with no break. And we are here this morning to highlight some of those issues. I'm going to ask the president of Action SA, you all know him, Mr. Herman Mashaba, to come and give us context much broader than what I have. And following Mr. Mashaba, uh, I will ask Mr. Funzing Gobeni, who is your Houghton Premier candidate. Don't scream. We're not here for Funzi today. I knew you were going to scream as soon as I, I say his name. After Funzi, so I'm saying this because I'm not going to come back here until the end. After Funzi, we will have Dr. Kose Litape, who is the Team Fix SA member for health. Uh, for Action SA, so give him a hand. Dr. Litape is going to to give us the broader uh, highlights as to why it is we're here and why the issues we are here to discuss this morning are as important as they are. And in the end, we will have Team Fix SA member, uh, Ausmpumi Edwards, who is looking after, yes, and um, he's looking after, you know, that one of our values is to professionalize the public service. And she's going to speak in her capacity as that, as well as close off at uh, this morning's proceedings for us. Thank you so very much. Please welcome Action SA President, Mr. Herman Mashaba. Good morning, Soweto. To Wayland, South Africa. It's really such an honor. It's always such a pleasure to really be here this morning. Obviously, with uh, mixed emotions. Emotions uh, of uh, having the joy that we have a party that's prepared to do something about the challenges where the country is facing. And like some of us uh, who obviously believe that they've got no powers to do anything about our problems. You and I are the solutions to this country's problems. So thank you so much uh, for being here. Just to really give you the current state of public health care in South Africa. Action USA as a party believes that the ruling party is constantly failing our people by providing sus substandard health care facilities while billions are stolen through corruption. 
I'm sure that's something that all of us have been used to for the last uh, 30 years. This crisis in South African healthcare is evident everywhere. People sleeping in corridors and critical surgeries delay, showcasing the system's decay. There are too many reports of how corruption has broken in our hospitals, not only here in Houting, throughout the country. During the COVID-19 pandemic alone, at the height of a human crisis, billions were stolen while people suffered, suffered in our hospitals. Our hospitals, like here in Barakwana Hospital, Chris Mateke, in Johannesburg, Chris Barat Hospital, where we are today, are struggling because the provincial healthcare department hasn't paid, paid the telephone bill. Even paying the telephone bills, uh, ladies and gentlemen. These whistleblowers who they, who they speak out against corruption are harassed or even killed. I want to highlight the importance of protecting whistleblowers. Heroes like Papita Diokoran, who was tragically killed three years ago, deserve better protection under the laws of our country. XNAC's commitment is to update legislation to ensure the confidentiality and protection of whistleblowers giving them legal immunity and access to remedial action. Action, action, plan, action essay is plan to fix the healthcare. And I think uh, Dr. Litlape will elaborate on this. What we need to do, we need to fight corruption and fight corruption unapologetically and fight it head on. We need to cut budgets on unnecessary expenditure. Just to really give you a sense of what I'm talking about, I had a privilege to be the mayor of the city of Johannesburg for three years. In the three years, from August uh, 2016 until October um, to, uh, 2019 when I left, managed to actually have savings of 2.1 billion rands of unnecessary expenditure. Let me give you an example. When I became the mayor of the city of Johannesburg, I think on the 22nd, when I was elected um, at the Johannesburg City Hall, two days later, in the morning, I wake up at six o'clock. I see lots of papers delivered at my doorstep. All papers, including African newspapers. Two days later, then I go to the city manager, Mr. T Dr. Trevor Mofala. He was the city manager at the time. I said, Trevor, what the hell is going on? Uh, papers, what time am I going to get uh, the, the time to read papers? I don't have time to even spend with my family. When am I going, I'm going to get time to read papers? Only to discover at the time, the city of Johannesburg was spending 18 million rands on newspapers. All the senior members uh, of uh, the city were getting papers delivered at their homes. 18 million rands. Luckily, luckily, the city did not really have a long-term contract, and I got that contract uh, cancelled with immediate effect. Secondly, in my office as the mayor of the city of Johannesburg, full bouquet of DSTV, full bouquet. Now tell me, when I investigated this matter, discovered then all the offices they are getting full bouquet of DSTV. All the offices. Now you tell me you've got papers to read, including in Africans. You've got full bouquet of uh, television. And I said, my God, well, how much? Did, when do people go away? Then I go to Trevor Fowler and city manager. I said, city manager, what the hell is going on? Like we were spending just under a million rands a month on DSTV. And luckily also, Luckily also, we did not have a long-term contract. These contracts were run on a month-to-month -month basis, so I could immediately stop it. This is just to give you a sense of, of the savings that uh, one can actually remove them from unnecessary expenditure and really put it there into important service delivery programs. One that is actually quite embarrassing. When we took over in August of 2016, at the time, the ANC government had already passed their budget. In this budget, international travel for the city of Johannesburg alone, 76 million rands of international travel. 
For the city, for the mayor alone, for the mayor alone, 27 million rands of international travel. And then you ask yourself, if the city of Johannesburg is going to travel, and at the time, we had 270 billion rands of infrastructure backlog. Now, when is the city, the, the mayor and the officials going to, to, uh, to, uh, to be working when they have to do international travel? What I did, that one unfortunately I could not uh, cancel because it was already in the budget for the 2016-2017. Uh, uh, but what I did, came out with a memo, discussed it with the, with the, with the city manager, Trevor Mfala. Said, Trevor, look, I cannot cancel this international travel because I don't know what people are traveling for uh, internationally and otherwise. The only thing that I want, please, every international travel that you approve, before you approve it, please bring it to my office to see where people are going. Because I can tell you, the 27 million rents in my office, there's not going to be any international travel. You know how much we spend from 67, at the end of June 2017, the, the entire expense on the international travel came to 3.6 million friends. 3.6 million. I never took any, undertook any international travel and all the officials who wanted to travel never traveled because they were too scared to bring the reports to my office to tell us why they were traveling. This is just to give you a sense. In two years, managed uh, to stop this vanity project uh, um, that uh, should have actually gone to for for uh, for 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 infrastructure spend. If you look at the budget when I left the city of Johannesburg, from the time when I came into into office and the time when I left, the budget for the city of Johannesburg in terms of uh, infrastructure, at the time when I took over. They, the, the ANC government, they had uh, infrastructure spend at 52%, so 53%. By the time I left, the infrastructure spend for the city of Johannesburg had moved from 52% to 73%. Just by just uh, really unnecessary savings that uh, we managed to really save the city. We need budget cuts, infrastructure neglects are crippling our health care. So urgent action is needed to reverse the strain. So if it can be done in the city of Johannesburg, I believe you can imagine at national level what we can save. In fact, one of the big savings that we are going to uh, enjoy as Action SA government, when you people of South Africa give us the mandate, we've committed during our policy conference that our cabinet will have a maximum of, of 20 ministers. Today, the current uh, the cabinet of Senator Ramaphosa has got 74. We are saying we're going to cut that to a maximum of 20, not a single deputy minister. And I've got three of the colleagues who are team, who are literally the, the, who are going to be in that cabinet. If you South Africans give us the mandate, with Dr. Litape as our minister of health, um, Bumi as our minister of public service, We've got Lerato Gubeni as Minister of Home Affairs. Our policy at Action NSA focuses on complete overhaul. We propose withdrawing private medical aid for public share office holders to ensure that they use and improve public health care. So if you're working for government from uh, the president up to the lowest end, and that's uh, obviously the recommendation of Dr. Letape. We, the, the, our XNSA government will not, private, will not provide um, medical uh, support. If you want medical, uh, uh, private medical health care, you, you must pay it for yourself. From the president, from the minister of health, if I get sick, I must be brought to Parakwana Hospital. That is the only way you will see how quickly our health care in this country Will, uh, will improve. Addressing poverty, malnutrition, crime, and crucial to reducing hospital pressure na na nationwide. That's what we will do. We'll reform, we plan to reform the health department by increasing frontline healthcare workers and fighting corruption. Additionally, expanding benefits and access to private healthcare for all South Africans in our agenda.
end, we would appoint more doctors, registrars, fellows, and specialists in the public health care system. It is simply unacceptable that hundreds of doctors can't really go jobless while hospitals are strained. Just last week, uh, Dr. Lidlape and I received a query from doctors here in Soweit, from the Farra and other hospitals, where they received a notice from the health and department that they are not going to be paid uh, their overtime. But they are made to work overtime. Where is the money going? It's going to, in Nazi Spanish, uh, the, the gimmick. We cannot accept that, that we expect our healthcare professionals to work well where the, the premier is actually using the public man funds uh, for political gimmicks. It's not even a, a proper uh, a project. So HNSA will save hospitals and clinics from experiencing load shedding so that healthcare services are not compromised due to power outages. And I'm sure you are aware <laughs> We won the case last year in the High Court for some strange reason. The President, the Minister of Electricity and ESCOM are appealing this case. And we went to court last week. We're waiting for the court judgment in this regard. Because as Action SA, we are saying hospitals, clinics, or schools, and police stations should not suffer from load shedding. Action SA is also against the National Healthcare Insurance Scheme in its current form, as it will provide the ruling elite with another opportunity to steal from the coffers. An action SA led government would rather prioritize the public health care system by eliminating corruption again, streamlining management and administration, and increasing investment in private in primary health care facilities. We want to achieve reliable and safe public health care where possible. It starts with removing this uncaring government and voting for change on the 6th and the 29th of October. Fellow South Africans, all these problems we can sit here for hours, or for days, for weeks, for months and years complaining. Where is the answer to this problem that we are sitting on? The 29th of May this year is going to be a determining day for all of us as South Africans to take responsibility. You can ask me or you can ask Dr. Letapio, ask any of us to come out with the solutions. But unfortunately, the only way we can execute our policies, the mandate has got to come from the electorate. So don't ever undermine your power because you've been taught over the last 29 years that you are a nobody. So we ask you, we urge you, and we don't want you to vote for HMSA. We want you to vote for yourself and vote for the future of your children, vote for the future of your country. No one can tell me that you can tell me 30 years down the line that you still believe in this current government. This current government has reached a point of no return and it requires all of us as South Africans to remove them and remove them in big numbers. We want to see on the 29th of uh, May this year, two days later, we want to see Funzim Gubeni as the preacher of how day. That is possible, fellow South Africans. Highly possible. You will know why it's highly possible. Look at us as Section SA in 2021. One year old party launched during the COVID 19. We contested only three municipalities. We contested as a law as a result of, uh, of IC playing games against us. Are you? Fellow South Africans and people of Houting, are you aware we are the fourth biggest political party in Houting? Fourth biggest party with 10%. And we see polls and so called experts on national television saying Action SA will be lucky to get 10 2%. When we got out of nine municipalities, we received 10%. And you can imagine at the time, we had no structures that we have today here in Soweto and uh, entire Houting. One thing I want to really assure you, come the 29th of May 2024, Action SA has to emerge as the government of how day. Action SA, if we perform badly nationwide, nationwide, we must emerge as the second or biggest political party that we can then 
coalesce with other like-minded political parties to work with us to, to put together a new government. But ultimately, let us all fight for outright majority. Let's not fight to be the second biggest party. Let's fight to get uh, number one. Because if you don't get number one, you get number two. If you don't get number two, I can tell you, I'll take number three anytime. Once we are number three in the country, I can tell you, the exploitation and abuse of our people will come to an end. We will usher in a new democracy. We will usher in a new future for our children and our grandchildren. The future of this country lies in our hands. I hope everyone here listening to us today is committed to unseating and democratically unseating this government. We are not going to unseat this government by burning tires, burning our hospitals and our clinics. We are going to ban, we are going to remove them by ensuring that we vote them out and we vote them out in big numbers. Thank you very much for all of you for being here. After this, we are going to visit, uh, do an in local inspection of uh, the challenges that uh, Dr. Letape will highlight about what's happening at Parahot, Paraponat Hospital. A hospital that majority of you were born in. The hospital that services the majority of the people of Soweto. But what has happened to it, it's unfortunate. But you and I are going to stop this not rot on the 29th of May. Thank you very much for listening to me. No, thank you, President. Um, uh, um, uh, I'm not going to be long, uh, President. Let me greet you and greet you the members of Team Fix of Africa. Let me greet all the counselors, the doctors who are here with us, the nurses, the professionals uh, who are working in uh, in the health sector, members of Action SA, activists who are here, who are working very hard each and every day to ensure that uh, uh, the dream of the president, that we must have premium COVID uh, and the legislation is fulfilled. And uh, President and uh, Dr. Letlape and colleagues, welcome. I mean, um, as the uh, Hauke Provincial Chair, I'm going to say things that you already know, but welcome to the province of life as it remain. This is the province of uh, dysfunctional clinics like the one in Zola. This is the uh, province of Tembisa Hospital. The corruption that we know that uh, has been uh, un uh, unleashed there in Tembisa Hospital. Uh, we are looking forward to solutions that will be able to ensure that the incomplete facilities that we have, the health facilities that are being built by this province, that are not being completed in the province, that um, when we take power after the 29th, we must go and complete those, because those will be our low-hanging fruit, uh, President. We must go and complete those projects. One of those projects uh, is in Enfulen. Uh, tomorrow I'm going with um, our Team Fix South Africa member, Tatesa Lolitiha, to Enfule to, to go and visit one of those health facilities that have been left uh, incomplete by this government of, um, um, of Payaza. Um, we, we welcome you to the uh, province of, um, of, uh, of the premier gimmicks. I think President has already spoken about it. This Premier Aaron Anglione is telling us that he's going to buy 18 private hospitals. Um, whereas we have all these Zola clinics that are dysfunctional, we have incomplete uh, uh, health facilities projects that are sitting and he says he's going to buy 18 private hospitals. So this is the uh, Premier that we are, we are, we are intending to remove uh, on, the 29th of, um, on the 29th of May this year. Um, so we are we, we we want to welcome you and we're looking forward to um, you telling us what is it that um, you have discovered during your time when you have been running in the in the in the health sector. Now that you are in politics, now that you are with us, we want to ensure that those ideas are now coming to ensure that we are implementing them. There's a lot of these projects. There's one that I visited in uh, in the Rain West, uh, there in Dunfontaine. That is also lying fun. Uh, there's another one which um, I'm sure you know about. During COVID, um, the province was given a hospital by a mining company. Uh, I think it's a Hamun there in, um, in, 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 in Ranfantil. 
They gave them a hospital that was in working condition. Uh, it has all the facilities and everything. Um, and then they decided to spend over 500 million on that project. But nothing was, uh, was actually done. In fact, as we are talking today, that hospital is vandalized. It's been taken over by uh, the Nyaopes and the, and the Zama Zamas. You know, a well-functioning hospital given to a provincial government to say, use it for COVID, but over and above that, our COVID failure ensure that this hospital is used for our residents. As we are talking now, that hospital is vandalized. So welcome and we're looking forward to uh, your remarks and the remarks of um, uh, Mpumi uh, Edwards. Thank you very much, Program Director. So it's good at one. The Dumelag. Hello. I guess for me, I'm an activist. And, and we, we honest people. Now that I'm a politician, I guess my DNA will change. So I will start by saying uh, I'm not going to be short. You know, politicians will tell you they're not going to be long, and then they speak for them. So I'm just bringing a, a honesty to the table. I'm not going to be short. And I just want to say that, isn't it ironic that yesterday, 31 years ago, is the day that Chris Hani was assassinated. Yes. And th 31 years and one day later, we stand on the Chris Hani road with Chris Hani Baragwanath Hospital behind us. And as Chris Hani used to say, he went into the struggle so that the poor should stop being poor. But what we see is governance that has made the poor poorer and the richer richer. You know, people are commenting to say, who was born at Barra? Now, I was born in Maryland's living. And that'll tell you what has gone wrong with our system. A lot of you came to Barra for normal vaginal deliveries when those should have occurred in the community so that this hospital should be used for complicated matters and tertiary care. So we need working health facilities inside the community, and we need the common entry points for everyone. You got to go to the local GP or the local clinic. That's where you start. And if we do that, we'll have a working, efficient healthcare system. Now, today I join you at the doorstep of a monument symbolizing the dire state of our healthcare system, which is in crisis with public health care on the brink of collapse. You know, JJ was asking me, and hey, has the system collapsed? And I said, no, it's not yet collapsed. Because in medicine, when we talk collapse, we talk resuscitation and certification. We're not at that point. We can still make it work. Chris Honeyborough Gwanath Hospital, much like most of our other healthcare facilities, is burdened by challenges from being shaved fully under-resourced with decaying infrastructure, which has led to its near complete failure to deliver quality health care to all patients. What we must confront is the reality that the, system, the systematic deterioration of our healthcare system is a consequence of decades of incompetence, mismanagement, and corruption. It is clear that while ordinary South Africans bear the brunt of a dysfunctional public health care system, the decision makers responsible for its near collapse are the same individuals who benefit from private medical aid, thus shielding themselves from the consequences of their poor leadership. This is why one of the highlights of the Action SA Health Policy is the withdrawal of all private medical aid contributions for public office holders and elected representatives. Instead, ministers and parliamentarians will be mandated to utilize only public health care services without preferential treatment at our public health facilities. Make no mistake, this will be an effective mechanism to ensure that those entrusted with the responsibility will work exclusively to deliver quality public health services 
from our public facilities. Human beings are driven by self-interest. The are in the severe fiscal realities facing our healthcare system. We are committed to reducing administrative budget to just 10% or less of the national health expenditure. Because if you can reduce admin expenses, you can ensure that the money goes to the areas where it is needed most. We are committed to ensuring that the salaries for professionals correspond appropriately to the levels of responsibility and skills they offer. If necessary, a specialized chamber will be established within the public service sector akin to those for magistrates to cater for essential skills. You know, when LGNSA talks about the general principle of insourcing, it is applicable and sorely needed in health. One of the reasons our training platform has deteriorated is that we have partially outsourced. We have something called remunerative work outside public service, which is basically an excuse from the previous government to underpay healthcare professionals. And that has been continued by this government. And that is one of the key reasons our health system is collapsing. People are not there to trade. People are not there to offer services. They come in, they clock in, and they leave to go and do private practices. And they are encouraged and allowed by the state. When we talk about professionalizing health services, we're talking about ensuring that if you are a full-time employee, you are appropriately remunerated, treated as a professional, so that you take care of your responsibilities fully. The notion of funding patient abandonment, which is what ARWABs do, which is what you do when you say to someone, you are a full-time employee, I'm underpaying you, but I'm allowing you to run a private practice to augment your salary. Something that is poorly monitored. Even if it was properly monitored, it is a morally bankrupt position. Because you are asking someone to do a full-time job, but to do it part-time. And you're expecting them to be well, to, to have mental wellness, and to be able to do their job. It's a disservice for patients in both the public and private sectors. You can only work efficiently for so long. Otherwise, we're just making money at the expense of the patients that you're supposed to take care of. We're never going to land that. So we will ensure that employment positions are adequately funded to acquire the necessary skills. We recognize that it is the primary duty of government to ensure sufficient funding for human capital in the health system and to guarantee that every facility has the necessary human resource capacity. If you are a CEO and you run a hospital, you should be able to tell us, I have a 100-bed hospital, I need a 1,000 nurses, 300 doctors, 10 security, uh, and we should fund you appropriately. And the public should know that as a hospital, you are properly resourced. If you are not, the public should know that you are not properly resourced and they come in at their own risk. So that people have the information to make informed decisions. This will result in a public health system which is being equipped with a professional workforce that is better compensated and capable of effectively managing our healthcare facilities. We will also prioritize the timely payment of essential services as telephones, water, electricity, food, through a well-managed budget. If you are a hospital like Barrack, you know what your expenses are from the Masti. You should be given at least inflation increased actual expenses from your previous year to be able to run a facility that can deliver services. The procurement of equipment for our facilities will be conducted directly from manufacturers, leveraging the buying power of the state to negotiate fair prices. A national health system should not merely accept prices, but actively negotiate them, 
acting as a shrewd negotiator on behalf of the taxpayer. When you have the buying power of the state, you should not be a price fixer. You should be a price fixer. The, 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 the president is a busy business and he knows the power of someone who has expansive buying power. We'll ensure that equipment comes from him. We'll original equipment manufacturers we will destroy this middleman economy where, which results in wastefulness and people that do not advance just because they are political equipment. If you remember, in COVID, we had politically connected people that could not, that don't know the difference between a boss and a syringe being the supplier of protective equipment. Such things will not be tolerated in a system run by Action SA. The public health care says serves as a primary training platform for healthcare professionals. We will ensure that those entrusted with training our healthcare professionals are adequately compensated as full-time employees is eliminating the need for them to seek additional income through abandoning their post and not any responsibility to ensure that people are properly trained. We will implement a monitoring and healthcare educational system that will be able to ensure that we get value for money and that the training institutions are adequately resourced. We'll ensure that if you have a facility that has a high burden of disease, it has the resources directed to them. You won't have a situation that we grew up in where there were more staff members at Charlotte McLean, but there were more patients at by. We will ensure that you are adequately resourced for the work that you do and the responsibility that you have for society. We will bring back nursing colleges that are embedded and linked to the training platform so that young women and men can come into this noble profession without any financial barriers. I don't know if any of you remember that when you wanted to be a nurse, you had to have a certain level of education, apply, and you didn't have to pay his fees. Because as trainee nurses, you also provided services. You're given a stipend, you're given a uniform, and you're trained, and you're given proper fit. That is why our hospitals were adequately resourced, but people were given proper values of the healthcare professions where you put your patients first. And can you imagine? If you take away those barriers, how many young people will seek this noble profession without any financial produce? It is unacceptable that we have young healthcare professionals willing to serve society, but are sitting without employment, sitting in rain in case at end. Not only will they be employed, but their employment will also be a sustainable employment for a lifelong career in public service. Action SA will ensure that medical legal liability expenses will be reduced by introducing the no-fault compensation scheme to the public health care system for a better management of medical related accidents that occur through care. But remember, if you fix your health care system, that you have people that are adequately resourced in a system that is properly equipped and properly funded, you will reduce the incidence of medical and legal issues. Prevention is key. We need to ensure that at our health facilities, we prioritize insourcing of security personnel. Most of you might be aware that last week in Temba Hospital, Healthcare professionals were attacked by people that came looking for tenants. There were no security to secure them in a public facility. That is something that needs to be addressed. We will introduce line budget and a reformed procurement system for each facility to have its own maintenance department that is controlled at the institution. CAPEX will be based on acquired on quotations from original equipment manufacturers. The procurement fiasco we saw during COVID will never be repeated under Action SA. Under Action SA, 
the future of our healthcare system will not revolve solely around treating illness, but rather promoting good health. HNSA embraces harm reduction, embraces the fact that we need to encourage people to be healthy, not waiting for them to be sick. So that when you come in to assist it, it's because you just, you know, had a mishap and we will restore you to good health and encourage you to go continuing on a good lifestyle. Let us work to it together to ensure that all humans are treated with dignity in our society. And you left politicians attending outpatient department in Russia at our expense will be something of the past. The head of state must get, must get his or her care from our public institutions. So there are two things that brought me to action is one, the fact that the officials will use the public health system. That's the way we fix public health. And the fact that we embrace that health is not about the absence of the disease. So it's going to be important to ensure that we work with the other centers. We have heavy tents that are conducive to health. I hope as we go along, we will not encourage people to squat. How can we eradicate TB when people are living on top of each other? When we live in squat. So we need to ensure that the socioeconomic conditions of South Africans are improved. That is how healthcare is improved. You know, people used to say, one of the things that has improved healthcare and livelihood, it's not medicine, it's sanitation. When you ensure that people have access to clean water, they have good habitats that are properly ventilated. They have access to good nutrition. They live in same neighborhoods where there is no crime. I mean, in March, I buried a colleague. I buried, I buried a nephew. And a week later, we had a 39-year-old pediatrician and a mother gunned down in Peter Maris. We cannot build our country if it is not safe. The healthcare system cannot be overburdened with things that are preventable. So the other factors of a secure society, access to food, good habitation, good transport, are essential for the well-being of the nation. I spent five years training behind here. This is home. Ke otse ke nalama da esi 200 meters from here. Baba Zaitsi. My father had a shop uh, here. So this is my neighborhood. And we need to ensure that the separation between the poor and the rich, that bridge is gap. As the president said, public servants will use public facilities. I will remind you, in 2010, there was a young doctor in a hospital in Pumalang, in Whitben, who was stepped by a patient. And they rushed him to a private hospital. Then he died in transit. Now, in a working system, if you stepped in a hospital, you should not die. In a large hospital like we have in Whitbank, that hospital should not have needed to rush the doctor out. That's how bad our system is. Now, you cannot fix the public health care system if you leave it in the hands of those that destroyed it. So make sure that on the 29th, if you want a better South Africa, vote for a better South Africa. I don't know say that in my life. Simonwen in Zanzi. President Mono, and thank you very much for giving South Africans hope and an opportunity to live again. Uh, I would like to uh, greet my fellow colleagues uh, that I will start with the Premier Inact. Oh, oh. oh Mr. Fonzi Goben, uh, sir, I'm greeting you. 
I would also like to greet uh, my fellow colleagues from Team Fix SA, Dr. Niklape, No Lirato Ngobeni. And uh, I would like to greet councillors as well that have been doing a great job in terms of ensuring that we deliver services in the municipalities that we are in as Action SA. And I would like to greet the health practitioners that are here today and uh, the activists that are here. Greetings to all of you. I was listening uh, tentatively to, I was listening to Dr. De Klape as he was um, explaining that he grew up here. This is a place of significance for me because this is where I was born, Banath Hospital. And my home is actually five homes from here where we used to stay with my parents. And my mom was a medical uh, practitioner and we really looked up to medical practitioners those days, I recall because being a doctor was highly regarded. I mean, every parent wanted a child to have a child who's a doctor. It was something that came with a lot of prestige. But over the years, uh, President, uh, we've seen a, a total decline, not only in the medical uh, sector, but in all the government departments. Colleagues, my name is Mpumi Edward. I am tasked with the, uh, the task a very big elephant in the room to deal with this task of public service, an ineffective public sector in South Africa. We have seen over the years that the public sector has declined. And Dr. Niklape says it hasn't collapsed as yet. But in my experience also with other departments, I've seen a total collapse where the trust uh, deficit has deepened between um, the government and the public. So we've got a public that, that does not trust in what our government is offering. So colleagues, I'm here to give you hope from a perspective of public service. I'm not going to dwell much on the issues that have been raised by Dr. Niklape, the issues that have been raised by the president, highlighting the inefficiencies in our public, uh, in our health sector specifically. But I'm here to give hope to the health practitioners that are here, to the pract uh, health practitioners in our country that are listening. And I would like to say firstly that what the cracks that we're seeing in the public, in the health sector, are, Dr. De Klappe, these cracks that we're seeing here are very familiar also within other government departments. In this week, uh, about two days back, I conducted an oversight uh, at the Home Affairs uh, Department office and the Labor Department offices in Soweto, in Maponyamon and in Orlando. And uh, Dr. De Klappe, what I saw there in terms of the working conditions of employees was troublesome. Because we had, for example, at the Labor Department, we had employees that were using a space that is very small, an office space that is smaller than this space. And those employees were tasked to serve thousands and thousands of the pub, uh, residents that were coming through their offices with only seven computers. How do we expect public servants to, 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 to function in that manner? So colleagues, I, I would like to outline uh, the policies uh, of uh, the public service department, the policies that Action SA is putting forth. And it, it's very important in South Africa that we are given this mandate because I think we're in dire situations within the public service now that really need dire interventions and solutions. The president has highlighted that the first thing that we're going to do, we're going to cut on ministries. We've got too many ministries in South Africa. We're going to cut those ministries to only 20. And all the deputy uh, ministers' positions, we're going to get rid of those positions because this is repetitions of functions. Their functions are not clearly outlined. We really don't know what they do. The second thing that we're going to do, we're going to focus on frontline service workers. Now, Dr. Diklape, from a public service perspective, we regard the health professionals, frontline service workers, because they deal directly with the, with our, with the public on a daily basis. We're going to ensure that our frontline service uh, uh, staff is capacitated, that we look after them. 
we, 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 we look at the working conditions as outlined by Dr. Litlape and we address all those working conditions. But not only the health sector, we're going to roll it out in all the government departments. It is important to note that the public service uh, department is at the center of policy implementation and service delivery. Therefore, our role and responsibility is to ensure that all the other departments are supported. But in, in terms of professionalizing the service sector, we need to cut on spending. Dr. Klapp, I agree with you. We need to cut on spending. But more than anything else, we need to investigate the issues that deem us to spend more, such as ghost workers in our systems. Hey, now, two weeks back, I wrote to the Minister of Public Service, or Minister Noko Nokivit, to address the issue of ghost workers in the Department of Education. So we'll be doing the same with all these departments, especially the health department, where it's known that there are ghost workers that are within this department. We will, we will do the same. We're currently sitting with a wage bill of over 34%, and we want to reduce this wage bill so that we're able, we're able to insource more workers, frontline workers, so that we're able to employ those doctors that are currently camping and sleeping outside in KZN. We've all seen the doctors, the prof health professionals that have been, been paying, allocated to hospitals that are without jobs. The question is, how does one spend seven years, Dr. De Klappe, and more, and more training to be a health professional, and then thereafter they have no job? There's no provision for them in the public service. So we regard ghost workers as a pressing issue for, for Action SA that we want to, to, to address. But Dr. De Klappe touched on a very important issue that as public service will be driving the issue of outsourcing uh, services by government. Hence, our premier indicated as well that we've got projects that are unfinished, uncompleted projects in the in, 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 in health and specifically. So we'll be ensuring that frontline service workers are insourced so that we're able to provide the tools of trade to all workers and support them. So in, in, in summary, uh, Dr. Niklape, our public service policies will be supporting exactly what you've delivered here today. We really want to assure the public. We want to uh, give them hope to say that uh, the policies of Action SA will really bring change because they are solution orientated. These policies, they cut across all the departments and they really bring real life solutions to each and every department. The only thing that is standing between us now and actually rolling out all these solutions for all these government departments that have collapsed dismally under the ANC government is the mandate. That is the only thing that is remaining for us to get a mandate. So we're pleading with you South Africans on the 29th of May this year, please go out in your numbers and give us the mandate to implement all these practical solutions that can change the lives of South Africans. I thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to each and every one of our speakers. Thank you to each and every one of you.